So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jessica Matthews, president of the Carnegie Endowment. Uh, it's my great pleasure to, to introduce General Mills to you. There are times when I think when history feels like it's kind of moving too fast. And um, from my vantage point these days, this is one of those. And while it's, it's hard to drag our eyes away from the enormous history that's unfolding in the Middle East, it's really critical to remember also that we are still in the middle of the longest war in American history in Afghanistan. 115 months as I count it, and, and still counting, uh, with 130,000 US and allied troops on the ground, um, uh, and a set of challenges, both military and, and civilian, that um, have proved enormously uh, resistant uh, to solution. Um, you all know the list. We have um, a government, local government partner um, that's really doesn't earn that, that moniker partner. It's neither popular nor trusted um, in country. We have uh, weak Afghan institutions. Um, and an insurgency that still enjoys safe havens across the border in Pakistan, a situation that in American history has proven to be um, uh, almost an insurmountable obstacle to, to uh, a military victory, certainly in both in, in Korea and in Vietnam, where we, f where we fo faced the same, the same problem. Um, the U.S. has made... Uh, obviously over this enormously long period, a tremendous effort, um, uh, changed strategies, changed leaders, changed relative emphasis of, of, uh, of priorities uh, in struggling to deal with this, this um, set of, of issues, um, and now faces one of the toughest uh, moments, which is to try to figure out um, how to begin to end it, um, uh, are we, as I gather, our title is the end of the beginning or the beginning of the end? Um, uh, and, and this question, uh, where, as we've seen this week with the Kandahar um, uh, prison escape, which for me anyway was, was, interest, was particularly telling because in the five months it took to dig this tunnel, it, into the prison, um, uh, at least as far as, as we're told in, in the US press, um, no Afghans uh, came to tell us or Afghan authorities uh, that this effort was underway. Tells you something about, about what we're up against. Um, we've heard from General Petraeus recently that uh, uh, a word of uh, cautious optimism um, about the military situation. Um, but we're now at the further into this year's uh, fighting period and, um, and, and facing, uh, I, I think, a, a changing situation. Um, we have with us today to share his insights in the situation on the ground. Um, we have the privilege of hearing from Major General Richard Mills, who for the last year has been the senior most Marine in Afghanistan and has been leading regional command southwest there where he oversaw 30,000 coalition troops in Helmand province. He has, uh, he had two uh, tours of duty in Afghanistan, I mean, sorry, in Iraq, and uh, before that also in Kosovo. So he has had a long, in the course of a, a highly successful 36 year career in the Marines, he's had a long experience with situations of insurgency uh, not unlike the one uh, that he has faced in Afghanistan. Um, so uh, we're going to hear his assessment after his last uh, tour of duty there um, of where we stand in terms of both civil and combat operations and what the challenges are ahead. And then we'll have a chance to ask him some questions after he's finished. And we want to thank you for coming uh, to share your assessment with us. And we very much look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank Thanks. you very much. <clears throat>
Well, I want to start off first of all by thanking uh, Ms. Matthews and the endowment for this opportunity to speak uh, for such a uh, distinguished crowd. And uh, I hope that uh, I live up to all of your expectations. And I look forward certainly to the questions that uh, that uh, I will get at the end of the uh, at the end of the brief. Uh, let me just qualify my uh, my presentation just a bit so you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the southwest corner of Afghanistan, Helmand and Nimruz province. Uh, and, and a small slice of Kandahar. That was my world uh, for the past 12 months. That's where I was, that, that was in, made up my, uh, uh, my area of operations. It's where I concentrated on and where I was focused. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any other questions about, about uh, Afghanistan as a whole, but again, that would be you know, my, my, uh, my opinion and not certainly probably not, uh, not forged by uh, personal observations. I spent most of my time, as I say, down in Lashkagar, which, uh, which is the capital. Just a quick background, uh, I was the commander of the uh, 1st Marine Division on Camp Pendleton, very happy of my duties. Uh, the uh, plan for the Marines in Afghanistan in uh, late 2009 was that the 10,000 Marines on the ground, commanded by a one star, would be replaced uh, man for man, and that would be the, uh, the extent of our, of our commitment there. Uh, in December 2009, uh, President Obama made the decision to, uh, to surge, and uh, I was alerted that I would be sent forward with uh, about 20,000 Marines. To, uh, to take over the, uh, the command there to expand our forces uh, within Helmand Province. I was also told at that time that I would uh, morph into a regional command, a NATO regional command that would encompass uh, the two provinces I spoke about and also take under my command about 10,000 uh, British forces. And within those British forces were embedded some other NATO forces, the Estonians, uh, the, the Danes, um, and we, I would also have Georgians uh, under my command. So it was a NATO force. My headquarters at Pendleton was then joined by about 120 British officers who flushed out my staff and made it a uh, NATO command. And my deputy was a, was a uh, UK one star uh, who served with me during my, uh, my year on the ground out there. Uh, what I had uh, based around 20,000 Marines was a Marine Air Ground Task Force based around a di Marine division of 13,000 men heavy in infantry, but also with tanks, artillery, uh, light armored vehicles, engineers, reconnaissance elements, a uh, aircraft unit that was comprised both of fixed wing F-18s and C-130 aircraft, and the entire gamut of rotary winged aircraft to include our V-22 Ospreys, the newest uh, aircraft that we had on the battlefield at that time, and some close air support provided by Hueys, Hueys and Cobras. I don't want to certainly insult anyone's intelligence, but just again to point out where we were operating in. It's the, it's the southwest uh, corner of, uh, of Afghanistan, Helmand and Nimruz province. There's about 2 million Afghans who live in that area. Most of those, about 1.5 of them, live within Helmand province. I will speak separately about Nimruz province. It was a different operation for me. It was a very low level of the insurgency there, so I approached it in a different manner while, they, while I was on the ground. Helmand Province, with its capital in Lash Gagar, has a long connection with the United States of America. And the people there remember the Americans uh, very, very well. Uh, back in the 50s and 60s, uh, USAID poured in millions of dollars to build an uh, agricultural irrigation system in Helmand Province, which, tr which turned the desert out there into a, a very lush agricultural area that was on about 10 kilometers wide on both sides of the Helmand River. The, the province is dominated by the Helmand River that runs from the northeast down to the southwest and eventually flows into Iran. Mountains on the northern part of the province, 10,000 feet in height, provided some uh, challenges to my aircraft. And it, it slowly slopes off down to the Pakistani desert and lasts uh, 100 miles uh, from uh, the foothills of the mountains down to the Pakistan border are pretty much flat terrain. The population is focused along the river. About 1.5 million of the, of the uh, 1.4 million of the 1.5 million in the province live in the string of towns along the river, as you might guess everything from uh, Kajaki in the north to uh, Kenish in, uh, in the south. Just one more word on the, uh, on the irrigation system, because it does play a very important role for us. Again, built by the Americans in the 50s and 60s, a simple irrigation system based on a large uh, hydroelectric dam built up in uh, Kajaki, which provides power uh, to parts of uh, Afghanistan, but more importantly, provides water control so that the, the area can, is farmed uh, 12 months uh, out of the year. The uh, irrigation system is simple, yet very effective, gravity-fed, and has been maintained by the Afghans uh, ever since. And they remember the Americans quite fondly there. Uh, the provincial capital of Lashgar was basically the company town built by the, the company that went over to build the, uh, the, the dam and the system. And if you see some old photos, and people will be happy to show them to you, you'll see uh, 
American ladies playing uh, tennis in short skirts at the uh, at the country club, and American men moving around, and uh, and Afghan people in Western dress also working uh, very closely with the Americans. It uh, was the breadbasket of Afghanistan for many years, and produced everything from corn, wheat, potatoes down to uh, world class pomegranates. If you haven't had a Hellman pomegranate, you haven't had a pomegranate. So, <laughs> put put the word out, please. Do me a favor. Uh, quite lush. When uh, the unfortunate part about it is the area is also probably a natural garden for poppy. Uh, and some 90% of the world's uh, heroin is produced there. It became a huge cash crop under Taliban and remains so under the insurgency. Focused in two areas around Sangin in the north and uh, Marja in the south, it's a cash crop that uh, every farmer dreams about. Guy shows up around October, hands you a big bag of seed, you throw it on the ground, it doesn't take much rain, it takes very little care. In April, it blooms in beautiful tricolored flowers, and then it hardens into a bulb, which you score, squeeze, get the sap out of it, and uh, another guy comes around in the middle of the night and collects that sap and pays you cash money for it. So it's a great, it's a great deal for the farmer who's just trying to feed his family. Unfortunately, of course, it goes, it ends up in the streets of New York, Chicago, L.A., London, Paris, has heroin. Uh, it is the main source of the insurgency's funds. Uh, we dealt with it as that, and we uh, interdicted it. We did, we did not get ourselves involved in eradication, but we dealt with the interdiction of those drugs as they supported the insurgency. Generally, when you found a cache of weapons, you found drugs with it, and the town of Baram Cha, which is down on the Pakistani border, I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute, is, was a uh, key node in that supply section. Drugs flowing south were sold there, weapons and uh, explosives going north were then bought and moved up to, uh, to fuel the insurgency. So once again, the southwest corner of Afghanistan. This was our operational approach to, the, uh, to our time there. I'll just point out a couple of, a couple of things here. Again, as you note, that's the, the river that flows there, that green line that runs north to south, the kind of snake. Uh, and those are the various towns along the river. Most of them are, in fact, uh, market villages uh, that you'd find in any rural agricultural area, small shops, uh, marketplaces, places where you can buy and sell cotton, wheat, potatoes, and unfortunately many of those places where you could buy drugs uh, a year or so ago. And that's not so uh, anymore. I'd also point out the fact that we operated very, very closely with the Afghan government. Everything that we did was partnered with our Afghan security partners, both in the military and in the police uh, role. I had a full core of Afghan soldiers within my uh, area. It was 215th Corps formed in March of 2010, and had three brigades, about 12,000 soldiers on deck, uh, well commanded, well led, and, be, and increasingly well trained. Uh, when I left uh, six weeks ago, they were, they were uh, effectively uh, conducting independent operations uh, with just uh, enabler support from our, uh, from our forces. Things like communications, uh, some supporting arms, air support, and medevac. Although they could have done their own medevacs, we gave them that support so they would get the same medevac capability that our, uh, that our own forces uh, enjoyed as well. Uh, we had an integrated uh, information campaign that we operated with both the uh, Western media, coalition media, and with the Afghan media in order to get the, uh, the story of what we were doing out on the street to the Afghan people. And uh, perhaps some slight change to what had been done before we got there was an emphasis on maintaining momentum on the enemy. When we arrived in, uh, in country, there was somewhat of a stalemate. We had, we had uh, cleared many of those areas that you see on the map, but our forces were relatively uh, stable. And the, in my opinion, the, uh, the enemy had somewhat of the momentum on the ground. He was able to dictate where and when the fighting would take place, able to use the IEDs to very lethal effect against uh, predictable operations by the coalition forces. We uh, decided to, uh, to change that. We consolidated some bases, freed up some forces, and we went on to the attack. We felt there should be no place within the province where the enemy was free to uh, train, refit, plan, and just take some time off. We went after him in his areas of uh, what he felt were relatively safe uh, havens. Uh, I'm sure people in this room, some of you probably have heard of Marja. Uh, the battle for Marja was underway when we arrived. Uh, we took a look around and used our intel, our intel uh, capabilities, decided the Battle of Marja was not going to be won in the streets of Marja, but rather was going to be won in the outlying communities surrounding Marja. Uh, the impact of that was to disrupt the enemy, push him back on his back foot, and have him react to us. We found that to be extraordinarily successful. 
Although a tough, resilient enemy, he has ways in which he likes to conduct his operations. He fights very linearly. He likes to fight in a series of positions that he can fall back on from one to the next. He doesn't like supporting arms. He's terrified of close air support. And he, he, wants, he, he is deathly afraid of being maneuvered against. All those we brought to bear on the enemy in a series of battles and, uh, and drove him away from the population centers, pushed him out into the desert, pushed him away from the green zone, moved him into areas where he could be less effective. Uh, we found that we had uh, some success at doing that. In the Battle of Marge, as I said, uh, Marge uh, was, was a major fight for us all last summer. And by the fall, it had, uh, it had morphed into a much quieter place. Uh, in Marja now, if you go in the streets of Marja today, there are restaurants that are open. There are kebab stands where you can get a nice lunch. There are bakeries. There are shops where you can buy clothing, shoes, whatever it is that you particularly are interested in. It is a town where downtown Marja has uh, very few security incidents whatsoever. And it is a town that has more and more uh, Afghan security providing their own uh, security out, in, out on the streets. The uh, Afghan police force, when I arrived in June and met with the, the elders of Marja, I asked about an Afghan local security force. They all shook their heads, absolutely not. They wanted no part of Afghan police. The Afghan police had a reputation of thuggery, thievery, and being shakedown artists. They said they would never accept an Afghan uh, police presence within Marja. In working with them over the summer months, in, in showing them some of our training objectives and some of our training techniques, they slowly gave in. We were able to transfer some veteran police officers from throughout the province into Marja to get a footprint on the ground, and then began to actively recruit the local Marja boys. When I left, we had five police stations open in Marja. We had 300 plus police officers on duty. 120 of those uh, police officers are local Marja boys recruited uh, off the streets of Marja and returned back to Marja to, uh, to do their, uh, their police work. Within the training perspective, we stressed, uh, of course, police uh, techniques and, and skills, but also we stressed an ethos of protect and serve, vice a paramilitary uh, ethos. And we again, seem to be having some success at doing that. One of the battles we had, of course, to be a police officer in, Mar in Helmand Province, you need to have a third grade education. It's very difficult to find anybody with third grade education in, Marge or in, in Helmand, for that matter. Uh, we, we think the literacy rate in Helmand Province right now for men is below 10%. Uh, but for ladies, it's probably below 1%. There's really no way to gauge the, uh, the female literacy rate because their uh, our, uh, our ability to, uh, to, to deal with them is, is relatively light. I'll talk about that again, again here in a minute. So we, are, we do have a liter literacy program ongoing, both in the police training academy and once they get out on the beat, uh, we use local teachers, again, to teach basic third grade uh, literacy. This is the way we found... Helmand Province when we arrived. That's the map on the left dated April of 2010. We found a resilient, robust insurgency that had been uh, kicked out of some of the key population centers, but was still a, uh, fairly, was, it was a significant presence within the, uh, within, the, uh, within the province. Of course, on that map, if it's red, that's bad. If it's yellow, uh, we've got the, the government of Afghanistan has begun to take control. Green is uh, government of Afghanistan uh, uh, control backed up by coalition force, of course. Uh, as you can see, in April, a uh, significant resilient uh, insurgency on the ground, well-funded through the use of uh, drug money, had uh, well-organized and significant lines of communication in order to supply themselves, flowing uh, in all directions, primarily uh, coming north out of uh, Pakistan, through the town of Baram Chaw, which is the red blob that you see down on the bottom. We focused on the population. Uh, and uh, we begin to look at the areas in which, of course, the main majority of the population live. Now, when we arrived, we were uh, obviously going, doing full-fledged coin operations focused on the population, but we felt that perhaps it had been a little bit out of whack. We felt that perhaps the, while you had to focus on the population, you could not lose sight of the enemy. You could not allow the enemy to dictate what was happening on the battlefield. You could not allow to murder, for him to murder and intimidate his way through the efforts that you were trying to make. So we attempted to rebalance that through that maneuver that I talked about a little bit earlier, to go take the battle to him, to make him uncomfortable, to make him uh, react to us. And we found that, again, as I said, to be relatively uh, successful. And as you know, uh, perhaps uh, through a series of battles, first in Marja, 
then down in what we call the fish hook, which is the southern part of the river, and then up in Sangin over the fall and winter months, uh, we regain the initiative on the battlefield and uh, have him, as you can see there, in March of 2011, and that's slightly out of date at this point. I would put some more green and some more yellow on that map if I were doing it again. Uh, we believe that we have regained the initiative in, uh, in controlling those, uh, those population centers. Again, the town of Marge that I talked about, and people think of Marge, it looks like Manhattan Island, but those are not roads. Those are actually uh, irrigation canals that crisscross the, uh, the area. I show this map it's just, to just give you an example of what I believe is, is, is some of the metrics you can use to judge whether or not we've been successful. This is a map, this is an overhead shot taken by uh, U.S. Uh, satellite uh, capability of the crops being grown in Marja. Remember that the insurgent fuels his insurgency through the use of drugs, through the selling of, of uh, heroin. On the left is uh, Marja taken above there in just before we arrived. If it's yellow, that's uh, poppy. That's insurgent controlled ground that, where poppy is being grown. If you see green, that is a, uh, that's wheat. Wheat also grows very well there. If you see purple, that's some other crop, not, not poppy. On the left is prior to our arrival. On the right, and I wish the one on the right were, were all solid, uh, solid uh, yellow, but um, it's a, uh, again, it shows you the progress being made. As we take control of those areas, and as the government of Afghanistan begins to move in and do what local governments do, one of which is a very, very strong eradication program, you begin to see the poppy disappear. Governor Mengal, who's the provincial governor, is, a, uh, is, is rapidly anti-drug. He has a, several very, very strong programs against poppy, and all of which are effective. He has a very strong eradication program, which he does on his own, uh, very effective. He has a crop uh, substitution program, which we work with him on, which again has been very, very effective. 45,000 farmers signed up this year throughout the province to take part in the uh, crop substitution program. What they were got was, a, was wheat seed, fertilizer, and lessons on how to grow wheat. Not for free, but at a reduced price. That encouraged them to participate, but it was not a free ride in any way, shape, or form. And we have seen success throughout the province on that. Will there be poppy grown in Helmand Province this year? Absolutely. But it will be a slow reduction, I believe. And overall, uh, what I see on that map is I see the funds the insurgent will not get. That is money he will not get his hands on. It's why Marge is so important to him. He fought for it so hard because it was critical. It was his bank. It was the way he it was his funding uh, source. He had to fight for it. In addition to being the center of the Pashtun community in Helmand Province, and of course it's a Pashtun insurgency we were fighting, it was psychologically important to him, but more importantly, it was materially important to him. He has to get Marja back. I fully anticipate a counterattack this spring. He can't give it up. He can't afford to. We believe we cut his operating budget last year in half um, because of the reduction of the poppy. How do we see that? What did that turn into? It turned into him trying to retrieve old IEDs from the ground that he hadn't used and having accidents doing that and losing people to his own weapon systems. We saw it in reduced ability of him to, to provide ammunition and new recruits to the insurgency. Like any commander, he relies on resources. When his resources are reduced, his fighting force is reduced. No question, no question about it. Again, that was the, the series of, of fights that we took. I, I showed you that one red uh, blob down on the border in Baram Cha. And I'll just talk very quickly about that before I move on to the Afghan security forces. Baram Cha is about 75 miles south of, our, uh, of my last uh, line of force across wide open desert. It's uh, kind of like the bar scene out of Star Wars. You go to Baram Cha, it's a big, big town, got about 150 shops in it probably. No people live there, just, uh, just crooked uh, shopkeepers. If you want to buy any drug in the world, that's where you want to go. If you want to buy any weapon system in the world, that's where you want to go. If you want to buy household products, don't go to Baram Cha. They ain't, they ain't there. You're not going to find them. But you will find about every drug in the world moving south to be sold out in the world market, and you'll find uh, ammunition, explosives, and uh, recruits heading north to, uh, to fight the insurgency. We decided that uh, that, that couldn't stand. Uh, we raided that place twice. Uh, once back last fall, we went in. We uh, took over the, uh, took over the, the bazaar. Uh, he fought for all of about uh, 24 hours to hold it. Uh, took some, he took significant casualties and he retreated. We went into the bazaar. Any shop we found that had weapons or drugs in it, we destroyed. Any shops that we found that didn't have those kinds of uh, things in there, we left standing. 
uh, we disrupted significantly his ability to resupply himself. And we saw that in the drop off in fighting come the, uh, come the f late fall. We went back in there uh, late winter. We're going to stay for a little bit longer down there now, disrupt him for a longer period of time, hopefully to disrupt the spring fighting season as it begins to emerge. Uh, he relies on Baram Cha to move, his, uh, to move his equipment north and to move his very important drugs uh, back out into the world, the world market. I always tell a story about that fight back last fall to show you that uh, you know all, all plans made by general officers are great plans. Perfect. Never have a problem with them. Colonels, refine those plans and make them even better. We went to Baram Char. Our plan was to attack the city because it was, in fact, a fort with a very traditional line of defenses. They had a large minefield laid outside. There was only just a very narrow little valley you had to go up to get to the city. That was heavily mined, protected on both sides by fighting positions. He was going to fight a very traditional set-piece battle against us. Key to our plan was to breach that minefield so we could flow forces through the, uh, through the narrow gap and then get into the city to, uh, to take it over. We laid out a very detailed plan. We were going to lay down a, a line charge against the mines. That's a, kind of an explosive rope. That goes off. It kind of clears the mines. Then you push a bulldozer, an armored bulldozer, through, the, through that gap to clean the last of the mines out. And then the vehicles follow uh, right behind that bulldozer. Bulldozer is key and key to this story. Great plan. We're moving south. Our, our uh, objective was to attack at dawn, at first light. So we had to, it was all timed very well. I was in one of the vehicles going south, just kind of, just kind of watching this brilliant plan unfold. About halfway down to the desert, 35 or 40 miles north of Baram Cha, the vehicle holding my one bulldozer breaks down, dead in the sand. I'm on the radio. Well, the general didn't have any good ideas. The colonels were kind of getting a little bit confused and a little bit, uh, a little bit excited. And the lieutenant colonels were getting more excited, and the majors were really excited about this thing. So we, uh, everybody's talking what to do, what to do. And in the middle of it, we try to extract the vehicle. It breaks an axle. Now I'm, now I'm seeing my, uh, my meritorious service medal disappear off into the distance. <laughs> right in the middle of it, young, uh, young Lance Corporal in E3 walks up to the vehicle, takes a look at the bulldozer, hops up on top, starts the bulldozer up, backs it off of the vehicle, asks the gunnery sergeant who was standing by, hey, guns, which way? And the gunny pointed south. He turned the vehicle south, put the blade up in the air, kind of like John Wayne in the Fighting Seabees, and he headed south at about three kilometers an hour. And uh, sure enough, as the sun came up over Barham Char, the bulldozer came up over the hills, and we were able to execute our plan on time and very successfully. But uh, I don't want to say for want of a nail, but certainly for want of a lance corporal, that could have been a very uh, long morning for me. Uh, moving down to the Afghan security forces, as we talked about those a little bit earlier. Uh, I had the 215th Corps in my zone. Uh, we got there. They had concentrated on raising infantry units, basic infantry units. They had three brigades. They were spread out over the battlefield. We had uh, our forces were partnered down to the platoon level at every level with the uh, with their Afghan partners. We began to work with them very closely. Uh, like any unit, they had unit they had trouble uh, starting up. They had a high UA rate, and we looked into that and we found that Afghan soldiers uh, go over the hill for the same reason that U.S. Marines go over the hill. If they're not getting paid regularly. If their facilities aren't very good, and if they don't have a regular leave policy to get home to be with their families, they simply decide that there's a, there's a better living to be made somewhere else. We uh, worked with them to get, a, uh, get their pay straight. As amazing as it sounds, an Afghan soldier is paid by electronic means. He's not handed cash. He, he has a, uh, it is transferred to his bank account. He has a, uh, a plastic card just like we all have. He has to go to, that, to a, a bank, transfer money from his account to his family's account, and that was a problem. So in working with the banking industry, we were able to get bank uh, uh, facilities, banking facilities set up at the Afghan army camp so that the soldier didn't have to run home to pay his family. He could do it electronically. And that, and that uh, coupled with an a, uh, effective leave policy, a fair leave policy that got everybody home at some point during their, uh, their yearly tour, uh, we dropped the UA rate down to less than 9%, which was, uh, which was pretty good. And uh, we began to see an army that was confident and was much more effective. And by the time we left, and they continue today, they conduct their own operations, as I said, in a semi-independent. They plan them, they deploy on their own, they execute the operations, and they withdraw, and they're not afraid to take on the enemy. The Afghan soldier is a good soldier. He's willing to, he's willing to fight, and he's, uh, he's tough in the field. The Afghan police forces, again, we have several levels of police force. The Afghan uniform police, there's about 7,500 of them now in the province. There'll be more next year as we, we raise what they call the Tashkeel or the Manning document, raise it slowly. 
numbers alone aren't going to do it. We need trained policemen out there. We don't need just policemen. We need trained policemen. So rather than surge 10,000 police all at once, we want to take it incrementally by steps so that when we put a policeman on the beat, he knows what he's doing. That has worked out, uh, again, well. We find police, and they're like police anywhere in the world. They're good units. They're good precincts. There are certain others that need, uh, need a little bit more uh, supervision. But again, through the partnership program, we are finding we are finding success. I knew I was doing all right when I went to Marja in March. And uh, if I had my video, I'd show you. But there's one particular street uh, crossing right outside the main bazaar that we had to fight for extraordinarily hard all summer. And you couldn't cross that that uh, four lane, uh, four, that four corner cross road. You couldn't cross that without having a duck from uh, RPG rounds and, and small arms fire. The last time I visited Marja, there was now a police officer stands there and directs traffic in and out of the bazaar, and he wanted to ticket me for jaywalking because I just simply barged across the road against his little sign he was holding up. I tried to explain who I was, but uh, it didn't cut the mustard with him, I'm afraid. And uh, so I think I have to go back there next month to pay my traffic fine. But uh, again, the police are beginning to, are, are coming online, taking more and more responsibility, manning their own checkpoints, manning their, uh, their t detention facilities, doing what police do, and they protect and serve mentality. Is there still corruption? Yes. Uh, is there still training that needs to be done? Yes. Do they still need to be partnered? Yes. But are they becoming more and more effective? Yes. Are they taking their responsibility for their own areas, places like Lashkagar? Yes. In Lashkagar, the provincial capital, uh, a couple of events over the past uh, year. Uh, in September, we had a, uh, a concert by uh, the Afghan Elvis, quite a concert. And the uh, Taliban told us that concert could not go. They would not allow it to happen in public. They, going to be held in the football stadium where the Taliban used to conduct their public executions. The Afghan police provided the inner ring of security. The Afghan army provided the outer ring. We stayed, uh, we stayed home and watched. 10,000 people showed up, enjoyed a very professional uh, concert by a, a guy who lives in LA, as a matter of fact, but he, he goes to Afghanistan for, uh, uh, to, 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 to give to, for entertainment and uh, put on a very, very good concert. Right before we left, we uh, had a similar concert. We attracted 15,000 people for a female singer who came in second in the Afghan uh, star search, uh, kind of the Afghan idol competition. And she performed in front of a mixed crowd of men and women, which is very unusual in Afghanistan. Once again, Afghan police provided their own security, and the Afghan army provided the outer ring of security. Perhaps most importantly, though, was the, uh, was the elections we held in September. We held the congressional elections that took place. Uh, once again, we were, the Taliban uh, told us that couldn't happen. Would not, they would not allow those polling stations to open, and they would kill anybody that showed up. The uh, stations opened at 7.30 in the morning on time, and they closed 10.30 that night again on time. We closed no polling stations during the day. We took no indirect fire, and we only had several, one or two incidents up in some of the rural areas of, uh, of gunfire, but that may have been over the election as opposed to uh, anything else. Uh, once again, Afghans providing their own security, planned by them, partnered with us, and I, and I sat down with them. We went through the security procedures. But again, Afghan security run by, uh, by Afghans. As you can see, the way ahead, continue to train them, continue to develop the Army, especially their maintenance uh, procedures. The Army itself is, fairly, is basically a light infantry unit. Uh, there are no uh, sophisticated weapon systems down there yet. Very, very basic stuff. They move around in Ranger pickup trucks. They have some, uh, some light weapons. Uh, which they can maintain themselves, and uh, their radio communication is, uh, is rudimentary but effective. Uh, again, we're not building a force, I believe, over there that they can't sustain in, in, the, uh, in the long run. Again, I talked about the Afghan-led operations. This shows you the continuum. Again, they started small. They worked, uh, they worked uh, to, to more and more sophistication, but more importantly, to more confidence. As I said, they are good fighters. They want to fight. They, they like to fight. Uh, well, as, long as, you, as long as you support them well, uh, you won't have a problem getting them to go to the, uh, to go to the sound of the guns. Stability operations, this was uh, as you moved out of security, once you did your clear, then of course you moved into what, what I called stability operations, you probably called development. I looked at development as being more long-term projects that might take some years to do. We worked on a more short-term basis. We polled the people. We talked to the, uh, the Afghan the local governance. What do you need? We didn't want to build football fields and you know, bus stations if that's not what they wanted. They didn't. What do they want? Number one, education. They wanted schools. Uh, that was the one thing they asked for immediately after the clear was over. Get us some schools. They understand the Taliban burned schools. They wanted them rebuilt. They knew what they had been missing. And so we went on a fairly aggressive program of putting schools up, both 
structures that had been destroyed, new structures, and some temporary structures such as tents. And the people came. 125,000 students uh, in, the, uh, in the school system this year, 20,000 of them women. Something unheard of under, under, uh, under the Taliban. Uh, rudimentary, yes, but effective also. Again, the people understand what they missed. A generation of illiterates. They know what that means. Uh, again, a story that I tell, and I don't want to take too much time here, but a story that I tell is uh, I went around and visited one of the schools in uh, one of the local villages. Uh, they, you know, they take in, and the general's here. It's a big deal. We, all, you know, we were all students at one time. and knew when a, you know, when a visitor came through, and kids were all lined up. And I went into the uh, third grade classroom. So we're talking about seven- and eight-year-old children. And they're all sitting there in rows, and they don't have desks. They sit on the floor and work off their copy books. And of course, the general comes in, so we, I got a song and uh, a poem, and you know, and, uh, and of course, the headmaster is very proud about showing off this facility. In the back row were uh, seven, eight, nine, ten uh, big boys, big, big young men. I'd say 15, 16 year old, uh, you know, grown up, grown up men. And this is a third grade classroom now, seven and eight year olds. So I was talking to the headmaster. And I looked back and saw these these large young men back there, and I asked him if that was the football team, and uh, he didn't get the joke either. But. Uh, <laughs> But he, he said, no, what they were were they were young men who had, who had not learned how to read and write, who were illiterate, who wanted to learn how to read and write. And they were willing to come in and sit down in that classroom to do it. And I thought to myself, you know, when I was 16, I would not have sat in a third grade classroom. My, my pride would not have allowed me. But they understood. And as we, saw the, as we saw the students arrive at class, as we saw the parents make this investment in the future, I began to believe in the sustainability of what we were doing over there. The Taliban threatened them. The insurgents threatened them. Uh, they said, if you will burn the schools, we'll kill the students, we'll kill the parents that send, send uh, the students to the schools, and yet the children came. Some of the schools will hold three sessions a day because of the, because of the overcrowding. Uh, the teachers are, we have, a, we have some trouble get, finding qualified teachers, but again, work in, work in that program. The, the, that's what they're looking for, education. That's the long-term development, I think, that means the most to them. Uh, in Garmshire, which is a relatively benign area, uh, several months ago, uh, on Sunday night, the uh, insurgents came to one of the towns, burned the school to the ground. Uh, we didn't know about it. We didn't get a report on it. Next morning, uh, some parents showed up at our local uh, outpost where we have some, some Marines and asked if they could borrow some tents. We gave them the tents. They took them out to the school grounds next to the still smoldering uh, embers, erected the uh, tents, and school was on by noon the same day. That shows you the commitment, I believe, that, uh, that these folks are making. Again, as we dealt with some of the other local issues, health, uh, again, working in rudimentary clinics, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I get to the uh, one more slide here, and I'll keep moving. Uh, uh, and again, infrastructure of roads was critical to them. If they ever want to have an economy that where they can really work commercially, they're going to need those, that, road, that road system. Governance, I've spoken about a little bit. I talked about the 2010 elections already. But once we had a good uh, district governor in place, and once we had a good provincial governor in place, Governor Mangal, we began to work on those district governments again to, to they could be, so they could be representative of the people. District governors are appointed, but the district community councils are elected. Five of them are in, in, uh, in operation right now. What they do is they prioritize programs. They budget the money that comes into the district. They work with us to find out what is it the people want as opposed to what is it perhaps that the Americans and the coalition think they ought to, they ought to have. That's Marsha. That's the district uh, community uh, election that took place. Once again, uh, there's 1,500 registered voters in Marsha. 1,100 of them showed up for the election. Uh, although it looks a little rambunctious there in the top picture, it was all very, very all great spirits. Uh, no one bothered them. There were no uh, shots taken at anybody. The election went on. 25 elders were elected to sit on the district uh, council, and uh, it's fully operational at this time. And more importantly, perhaps, it now begins to get funding from Kabul. Money begins to flow down through the Afghan government to the local levels for projects the locals want to do. Uh, I talked a little bit about Nimruz. I'll just very quickly say this. Uh, Nimruz province was a different animal, a very low level of insurgency, a fairly decent police force, and a good, actually a good provincial governor that was in place and uh, operating some schools and, and doing what provincial governors do. Very low population. My uh, thoughts there were not to make that a military operation, but make, to make it a, a joint interagency operation. Uh, Operation. So we formed Task Force Nimruz of civilians and military. Uh, I put a lieutenant colonel in charge, and he dealt with the governor down there on things as, such as you see. Some improvements uh, to some of the economic areas, some school improvements, a uh, canal system that was uh, had badly deteriorated, those kinds of projects. My intent was to turn that over to the civilians entirely. I didn't think there was a military need to be there, other than perhaps some trainers with their local police 
local police force. But other than that, we thought it was uh, uh, probably the wave of the future as things might look not, hopefully not too distant future. Almost finished here. Uh, a huge part of the population of Afghanistan we have very little access to. That's the females. Of course, everything that we operate with is carefully structured within the cultural norms of the Afghan society. It's the way it has to be. The role of women in that society is, is quite different than the role of women, obviously, here uh, in the United States and in the Western world. But you have to respect that. We're not there to change Afghan society. Uh, we were there to educate, we were there to work with, but not to change their bottom line beliefs. Also, uh, Helen Province is a rural farming community, quite conservative in its values, and, as I, and again, as I say, uh, fairly illiterate. So again, you have to take all those factors into consideration. I had a very strong major on my staff. Uh, she's a, uh, a school administrator from uh, San Francisco, a reserve officer. I made her my, uh, my gender advisor. And we worked closely with uh, our female engagement teams, which were small units of four and five young female Marines and sailors, and put them out with our, uh, with our combat forces to do engagement at the local level with females in the villages. We had success in some places. We were a little, little bit tougher in other areas. Obviously, the more rural areas were perhaps a little less receptive than some of the more, some of the more uh, uh, cosmopolitan areas uh, of, of, the, uh, of the village. But anyway, we, we were able to engage an awful lot of Afghan women, people that we as males had no access to, absolutely no access to. Uh, and we did two things, I think, with the female engagement teams. The first one was to set the example to the Afghan men of what it is Western women do. Uh, when they would come into a village fully, uh, fully uh, combat outfitted, helmets, flak jackets, carrying weapons, and, and they began to take some of that stuff off in the meetings, and they saw their hair, the men, the Afghan men were amazed. The Afghan men were amazed that we had women issuing orders to males. Uh, you know, rank structure is rank structure. If you had a, a senior, senior Marine who happened to be female, and she gave orders to junior Marines who happened to be male. Again, a huge example to the, to the Afghan men who saw that. Uh, that was kind of teaching by uh, you know, the indirect approach, I think, if you will. More importantly was they got the, our female engagement teams got inside the buildings, got inside the compounds, were able to sit down with interpreters, female interpreters, and talk to the Afghan ladies and see what it is they wanted. Two things, they wanted health uh, healthcare and they wanted education. One, two, all across the board. And uh, we would, again, then work with the village elders to provide those things. We were able to get some female doctors in town. We were able to get some female uh, corpsmen out and about and do those kinds of things. It was kind of it was difficult to do, but it was, but it was very, very, very um, worthwhile. And uh, again, we did have some females who sat on the uh, provincial council level. They were edu educated uh, ladies who lived up in Lashgar and did a good job. But again, our female engagement, I think, uh, again, opened up a very large section of the population, again, we did not have access to and provided us with some great insights as to ways in which we could be, uh, we could be effective. The other thing we worked out was freedom of movement. And when people talk about freedom of movement, generally they mean roads, moving people, pe moving people and goods around, absolutely, positively, that yes to that. The Afghan people are very sociable. They like to travel, especially on their holidays, visit their families, much like we do. We worked very hard at building roads, spent an awful lot of money putting in hard surface roads. We got there one hard surface road, which was the ring road that runs around Afghanistan. Goes east and west, didn't do us much good. Most commerce in Helmand goes north and south. So we worked very hard at hard, hard packing roads and building, repairing bridges and infrastructure. Uh, again, with our, with our limited means to do so, but that had a huge impact down at the local levels. Once you got a road in, schools followed, commerce followed, uh, and the people truly, truly appreciated, uh, appreciated it. But the other piece of freedom of movement, I felt, was freedom of movement of ideas. How do we move ideas around? That's how we're going to change, the, change that environment over there. I've already talked about the schools, which is our main focus of effort. As we dealt with the females, we tried to look for some ways in which we could educate them. Uh, they're, they're not a, um, although they are, you know, in some ways, uh, not a very developed cult country, they're, in other ways, they're very developed. And they, uh, the radio is a big, huge media. Everybody listens to the radio over there. So we put together a program to try to teach women how to read by radio. We got some school books, we got some instructors. Uh, we talked to the females with the engagement teams and said at this time, on these days, there'll be some classes taught. Uh, the success of that operation is yet to be determined, but it's a step at least in which the ladies who can't leave the house are able to, uh, to get some exposure to the education system. We'll, we, will see, um, we will see what works out. The other, the other thing was uh, radios, or was uh, cell phones. <clears throat> They're very big on cell phones. Everybody has a cell phone over there. It works, it works, uh, it works great. Um, Taliban controlled the commercial cell phone towers through threats and intimidation. Didn't allow that, that forced them to be turned off at 1800 in the evening, 6 o'clock for civilians, and not come on until the following morning. 
just as a show of power. We put in our own cell phone system, which allowed them to have 24-7 coverage and work with the commercial companies to say, we'll provide security for you if you keep those towers, those towers open. And we were making good progress on that. Uh, just one quick story here. The, uh, and I know, I know I'm about out of time. Uh, we're on the cell phone towers, I knew I was making, making, making headway when I went into a cell phone store in one of the villages. A guy was selling cell phones and, and, and uh, phone cards. And I went in and talked to him and through the interpreter, and I said, how's business? And he said, oh, it's OK. You know, it's, it's, it's all right. Typical Afghan response. Business could always be better. And I said, well, how's your cell phone coverage here in the village? And it was a fairly remote area. And oh, he says, that's terrible. It's absolutely terrible. And I, I was shaken by that. I put all this effort into you know, doing this. And I said, what do you mean it's terrible? And he said, well, when I want to call my mother in Lash Gagar, which was about 50 miles away, I have to go out in my backyard till I get a good, till I get a good connection. So I asked him if he was a Verizon customer or something. I, <laughs> I said, my wife lives in San Diego. She spends half her time in the backyard trying to catch the satellite. And I said, you know, and geez, I mean, so sometimes expectation management is the most important part of what, you, of what you're doing, I guess. And I apologize for running over. I hope we have some time for questions. But uh, again, I, I appreciate everyone's attendance. Uh, I have been accused, perhaps, of, uh, of, a, of a bit of a, uh, having a bit of a rosy, a rosy uh, regard. I do. I think things are, are better than what are reported over there. I will tell you that an independent survey, not done by the Marines, not done by the coalition, that was done this uh, late, early this, uh, this year, showed that uh, nearly 80 percent of the Afghan population in Helmand province, when polled and asked, what's your number one concern? Last year, overwhelmingly security. This year, education. Over 65% of them said they had daily dealings with the government of Afghanistan at the, at the district level to resolve problems and to resolve issues. To me, that is, that is success. And uh, the last thing I'll say as I close is to say that, uh, you know, I know there's, a, there's kind of a thing in town that uh, schools cost you three cups of tea. Uh, th these schools didn't. Uh, I had uh, over 200 uh, KIA. I had over 2,000 WIA. Uh, and the Afghan army and police force lost hundreds more than, uh, than I did. Uh, I can tell you that we uh, probably killed 10 to 1 of them. Uh, they lost a heck of a lot more soldiers on the battlefield than we did. But uh, there's, a, there's a price to be paid for, uh, for what, what happened last year. OK, with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Let's take three at a time, if that's sure, okay with you. Sure. I'm sorry. Um, and, then, and so if people will be brief, we'll start with these three right here. And please do identify yourself. And um, thank you very much, General. My name is Judd Harriet, a documentary filmmaker. My question takes you somewhat off your brief, but uh, the Wall Street Journal this morning published an article saying that the, um, the Pakistanis are trying to push the Afghans away from NATO into the arms of a new coalition, Pakistan and China. Now, again, this is off your brief, but I would really like to hear your views on this. Thanks. Perhaps maybe from Jessica okay. as well. OK, thank you. And right, right next to you. Yeah, General Mark Thompson, Time Magazine. Um, the Taliban commanders that were in your AOR, how many of those, to your mind, are flippable? And how many of them are incorrigible? Thanks. Right here. Uh, Dennis Cooks from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, you've given us the bright side, General. Uh, what's the bleaker side? Uh, and then a second question. Could you tell us what the status is of the, uh, the, uh, the power up at the dam? Sure. Thank you. Re regards, 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 uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Regards Pakistan. Just Slide over a little bit. Um, regard, regards uh, Pakistan, um, I, I really can't comment on uh, being pushed into a, a new coalition. I, I will tell you this. I will tell you that in the dealings I had with the Pakistani army, uh, I found them to be very cooperative with us and to, uh, to be, to be uh, fully supportive of what we were doing. Uh, I, I talked about the, the fight down at Baram Cha, which was right on the Pakistani border. Uh, we had to alert the Pakistani army to that, uh, to that operation and ask for their cooperation in certain, uh, in certain ways. They were they were forthright and uh, quick about giving those giving those uh, those those, uh, those assurances and providing that cooperation. Although I did not have Pakistani forces involved, we uh, we had significant uh, 
permissions that we had to gain in order to c conduct that, that operation. Um, I would say overall, again, in my dealings were very limited uh, with the Pakistanis. They, they were, in fact, uh, supportive of what we were trying to do along, along the border. There are, that said, no, there was no question that guidance was coming out of Quetta. There's no question that there was a, that there was a refuge for them in Quetta uh, and that they were being uh, directed at the, at the kind of at the two or three star level from that, from that area. Uh, many of their uh, low, lower uh, ranking commanders, uh, the, I will say for better, the colonels, would go back there uh, frequently for, uh, for consultations and advice. And we knew there was a, uh, a flow of uh, illegal weapons moving north out of, out of those areas to, uh, to, to fuel the, uh, the insurgency in Afghanistan. Um, but I, again, from my, my limited, limited uh, observation, uh, the Pakistani government was, and the Pakistani army especially, was uh, supportive of our operations along the border as long as we gave them plenty of notification and were open, open with them about our, about our, about our plans. Uh, regarding the, uh, the reintegration process, the government of, Af of Afghanistan has a very robust reintegration program to bring uh, insurgents back to their communities. I think it's, it functions on two levels. The first level is a very formal system in which you, uh, you formally present yourself uh, to the Afghan authorities, you formally uh, surrender your weapon, and then you are reintegrated through a system of education and jobs back into your, into your community. That, uh, that system is been slow, in all honesty, and taken off, but it, it, the, the, the structure's there. It's just that the, um, as of yet, I have not seen a, uh, a flood of people coming over. However, that said, at the, at the trooper level, at the kind of the, the private through sergeant level, we, we are seeing, um, anecdotally, uh, some, pretty, some pretty solid evidence of, their, of them coming back over to, uh, to uh, go back into their communities, be returned in a much more informal basis, simply to be brought back to their families, uh, given jobs back on the farm, uh, and without without a lot of uh, bells and whistles attached that would uh, that would attract our attention. I remember meeting very early in my tour with uh, with the mullahs, who I talked to on a frequent basis in the, in the province. They're obviously men of of great uh, great import and uh, religious leaders. And after a long discussion and a nice lunch, one of them pulled the leader pulled me aside and he said, "Generally, he says you understand about uh, about the insurgency." He said, "Of the hundred percent, he said there are probably 70 percent that will come back to the, uh, come back to their villages, come back to their homes and just simply drop their weapons and just become, just lead a normal life. He said there's probably 20 percent that will take some form of formal reintegration. They have, uh, they have blood on their hands and there's, there will be some kind of a process to, uh, to bring them back and then to watch them uh, after, that, after that takes place. And he said there's probably 10 percent you got to kill. He said they're, they're, they're just, they're incorrigible and you've got to kill them. Uh, and uh, he was very forthright about that. And I think probably if you look, when I'm looking back on it after about a year, I'd say he probably had his numbers, uh, his numbers pretty, pretty, uh, pretty solid. Uh, the weaker side of the, um, of what I talked about, and there is a weaker side, of course. First of all, is that is the counterattack that I talked about. I believe that he has to counterattack. He has to come back. Uh, our job will be to figure out how he's going to do that. I, I think we're positioned very well over there to counter whatever he brings. But he's going to—he's he's, got to do it. Um, Helmand Province is the very heart of the Pashtun community. Um, it's where that with with Helmand, with Kandahar Province next door is where the insurgency gets its roots and gets its feel. So psychologically, it's extraordinarily important to him. He can't give that up. But I think more importantly, like any commander, he needs to ha he needs resources. He's got to fund his people, and we know he's having problems. Uh, we've seen. Uh, evidence that uh, local commanders are having to sell their personal effects in order to pay their people. We have, we have seen evidence that they're running short of very critical military supplies. And he's having problems bringing people the $10 a day Taliban, the, the young man who's just simply working for a paycheck, and there are a lot of them in the Taliban, that uh, he's having trouble attracting those guys because he doesn't have the cash to do it. Why didn't he have the cash? Because the drugs aren't available for him to sell. That's why. So he's got to come back to places like Marja, places like Sangin, which are his, those are his Fort Knoxes. That's where he's got his money. His money grows in the ground, and it, it gets sprung up every year. And that's why the, uh, the drug trade is so important to him. And that's why our interdiction efforts, we, which we have seen hundreds of tons of narcotics, are very critical to the war effort because it, it cuts him away from the one thing he needs, which is money. It's, it's fueled by that. Okay, let's take two right there and, uh, and one over here. Let's start right here. 
Hi, I'm Sid Standifer with Inside the Navy. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about whether MARSOC has brought any particular kind of capability sure. to the fight in southern Afghanistan, and also um, if you could talk about any issues that you've been having with UAVs in terms of reliability, uh, deconflicting airspace, um, communication, and what kind of improvements do you think you could see there? Thank you. I'm right behind. Hi, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Pete Gabriel, U.S. Army, retired. Thank you very much for your presentation. Spent a lot of time in Pakistan, but uh, very interested about your dealings with corruption at, at the local level, uh, how you would deal with it, and also how you see things three to five years out uh, with our potential pullback. Thanks, sir. Thank you. And there's one right here. Go ahead. No, right there. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Kanisha Marks from Asia Society, Washington. Um, the female engagement group seem to really have tapped into the female population, but um, what will happen after the U.S. exits Afghanistan, and will there be any programs to help women? You're not going to make this easy, are you? Okay. <laughs> Reg regards MARSOC. Mars MARSOC has played a very, very vital role uh, for us, uh, and I can give you numerous examples. The, the, uh, the special forces across the board, both U.S. Marines and uh, the SEALs and the U.S. Army Special Forces and the U.K. Special Forces under, under us down in R.C. Southwest, played a huge role in disrupting the C-2 capabilities of the insurgency. They, in fact, uh, very quickly, they gutted the, uh, the C-2 capability. When we got there, it was estimated the average uh, regimental commander, battalion commander, whatever you want to call him in the, in the uh, insurgency, was about 35 years old. When we left, he was 23. Why? Because he's, the rest of them are dead. What does that mean? It means they're promoting younger and younger men to more and more uh, and less experienced men into greater responsibility. That's a weakness on, on, on his part. Uh, the special forces were absolutely invaluable in us attacking the IED networks at the, uh, at the provider and maker networks uh, at level and taking, taking those down. One, and the other thing that MARSOC did for us very effectively, along with the other special forces, was to uh, provide local village stability operations. We would put them into areas that were fairly, uh, they were still being contested, and they would go into local areas, talk with the elders there, stay in the village, establish a safe house, if you will, and then begin to recruit local local boys to provide local police uh, protection, for the, both for the elders and for the village itself. And that became that expanding ink blot that, uh, that you've heard so much about. It's very critical that we do that. They're good at it. Uh, they're very brave men. Uh, they, they are in very, very dangerous situations. Uh, many times they fight for the first 10 days on the ground until they kind of sort out who's who, and then, uh, then they begin to expand into uh, more peaceful uh, uh, developmental projects, which, which, again, turn that village over to the government uh, of, Af of Afghanistan. One of the things we do with that very early is to get the district governors involved, district chiefs of police involved, so it has an Afghan face to it. We do not want a coalition face. We want an Afghan face out in the crowd. Regarding UAVs, and the only weakness is I could use a lot more of them, they were absolutely the uh, they were absolutely invaluable to us, both in our uh, in our campaign to uh, to take out the C2 and, and take out specific highly valued intelligence targets. The UAVs gave you great efforts to do that, uh, but the other thing the UAV gave you, along with you had the full motion video attached to it and weapon systems, was the ability for very precise fires uh, against very uh, uh, easily identifiable targets in an environment where civilian casualties were our number one concern. We did not want to uh, cause civilian casualties. So with the UAV overhead, with that good imagery that we could get down link to the proper decision makers, we knew the weapon systems we wanted were being applied against the targets we wanted at the time we wanted when there was no threat to civilians perhaps being on the ground. So the UAV uh, reliability was good. You know, it's probably like any other, any other aircraft. I'd say 80 to 90% reliability you know, up, up on a daily basis. Um, uh, never an issue that would cause us to uh, have operational operational problems. Uh, corruption, cor you know, corruption, uh, you, you've clearly identified the, tar the, uh, the issue. Corruption is pervasive. It's, it's part of, their, of the culture there. It's something you have to work around with and hopefully by through example and uh, by, uh, uh, by targeting and, and helping the people to develop a rule of law and a, and a system of, of courts that can take that on, that they will change. In my personal opinion, that's going to take some time. Uh, you've got to really change the uh, some concepts, and you've got to change some some 
just some ways of doing business. The, the price of, uh, of, of Afghanistan first business practices where you're giving contracts to Afghan companies, Afghan workers, uh, the great benefit there is you're getting money into the Afghan system and you're getting employment, which is very critical. The, uh, the, the bad side of it, the flip side of it is that you, of course, are, are subjected to Afghan corruption uh, tactics. Um, I think that we're attacking that the best ways that we know how. I, I think that it's, uh, it, but it is a long-term problem that just needs to be needs to be addressed. And you know, when you look at, it's great to say you're going to make Switzerland, but when you look at the you know look at the rest of the world, you know, corruption's not it's not an Afghan problem. It's it's everywhere. So, um, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely spot on. But again, in the short term, it's something you have to deal with. You have to work your way around. Um, regards the, uh, the female engagement teams, has a very very good question. I appreciate that very much. They were extraordinarily effective, as, as we said. Uh, I think the, uh, the ladies in Afghanistan were uh, first surprised and then very pleased to, that, that, we were, we, that we were dealing with them. And as long as we didn't have men working that issue, they could never have done that. Uh, it, was, it, was a, uh, it was really interesting to see that, par that part of their, their society open up to us. And um, the female engagement teams, much like all of our developmental projects, and all the things that we tried to work to include the security piece, the, the fund one of the fundamental planning uh, criteria that you had to have was we can't we we can't disrupt them so when we leave here we bring down we bring down uh, you know retribution on anybody we certainly are not going to turn you know we, we're not going to start the league for women voters in Afghanistan this week I gotta tell you okay I mean what you can do is educate what you can do is set an example what you can do is reinforce through personal uh, uh, you know th through personal conversations but uh, to uh, to uh, Think that you're going to you're going to uh, empower the Afghan women overnight it, is foolishness and uh, it is dangerous. And so we we, did, we never attacked it that way. Our our female engagement teams were carefully screened, carefully uh, prepared, and when they went in, they were they were talked about how can we what are some what are projects we can do that are not entirely disruptive, and things like healthcare very very critical midwifery, tremendous number of Afghan women die in childbirth. Midwifery is something you can teach relatively, re relatively simply. NGOs do it all over the world, and it's something we can leave behind and turn over to the, the UN, uh, places like that that can that can continue that that operation. But you're you're spot on. To, to, we're not going to rebuild America, and we're not going to leave them in, in a dangerous position when we, when we when we do in fact leave, and they and they all know we're leaving. Um, I know there are more questions, and I'm, I do apologize. We're already 15 minutes over our scheduled time. So I just would ask you to join me in thanking General Mills uh, for an enormously informative. <laughs>